we at Olympic are always at forefront when it comes to the knowledge sharing and dissemination initiatives. In our efforts to do so, I am very happy to present the first of a series of knowledge enriching program powered by Olympic called Knowledge Beyond Boundaries. We truly believe that knowledge is a boundless and needs to be shared across the globe. Through this initiative, Olympic shall bring renowned international and national faculties who will share their views and experience on various topics of gynecological interest. Today's topic is non-invasive therapy of managing fibroids. Let me not stand between you and our learned faculties. I now hand you over to the moderator of the webinar, Dr. Niranjan Chavan. Dr. Niranjan Chavan is a professor and unit chief of LTMMC and LTMG Hospital, Mumbai. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and all our Good viewers up. across Algiers, Singapore, China, France, Senegal, Belgium, Tunisia, Mali, Morocco, and of course, our own India. Welcome to the Times of Gynecology. The live webinar is on. I thank Alembic and Science Integra and Maharashtra chapter of Indian Association of Gynecological Endoscopies to be a part of this international wonderful TOG webinar titled Non-Invasive Therapy of Managing Fibroids. Today, I take the pleasure to welcome Dr. Lee Keen Wai from Singapore. He is consultant, obstetrician and gynecologist having private practice at Glean Eagles Medical Center, Singapore. He was also the past president of ONG Society of Singapore and has been awarded many awards, namely the National Serviceman of the Year Award in 1996 for his leadership and dedication to the Singapore Armed Force of Medical Services. Dr. Lee has been a medical volunteer to Singapore International Foundation and has participated in medical mission during the aftermath of the tsunami in 2005. His field of interest is non-invasive, high-focused ultrasound treatment of fibroids and endometriosis and he's going to share his knowledge of more and experience of more than 35 years to all of us. Welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you. Along with him is our own Dr. Narendra Malhotra from India. Who doesn't know Dr. Narendra Malhotra? The, our audience is eagerly waiting to hear both these tall words. We all know him as the past president of SR, ISPAT, and FOXY. Presently, he is a member of FIGO Guidelines Committee. He is also the dean of ICMU and has to his credit, many orations and scientific papers been published in international and national journals. He is also the professor of Dobrovenik International University and he conducts I and Donald CMEs all over the world. He is a pioneer in ultrasound and we all are waiting to eagerly hear from both of them. Now, let me also tell you, when I say our audiences is waiting, you all should know that today we have a live audience of 2,200 doctors across the globe. And before I hand over to Dr. Lee today, I am happy to acknowledge that we are celebrating the Earth Day today. We living homo sapiens thank this Earth for letting us live. And I have no words but a video to showcase the beauty of nature which we need to preserve. I present to you
over to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Well, somebody have to. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. We will have the screen sharing now. Okay. Uh, I must say this is the first time I'm making a presentation, not looking at a live audience, but actually I'm talking to the laptop. So if you are uh, as fam unfamiliar as I am, I really beg your pardon. So first I must thank the organizing committee, especially uh, the Federation ONG Society India, Foxy Mumbai Society, and of course the Maharashtra chapter of Indian Association of Gynae Endoscopies, and the people who uh, are behind the scene to organize this uh, seminar. My topic today is from minimally invasive surgery to non-invasive virtual surgery for fibroids and adenomyosis, it, called HIFU. It is the high intensity focused ultrasound. Introduce the, the society which I'm very close to. I'm a co-founder of the Asian Pacific Association of Gynecology Endoscopies. Uh, this is a photo taken in 2003 in Taipei. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can see, but uh, this is Dr. Prashant. Uh, this is Dr. Harry Rich. This is, I think, Dr. Bruce. And this is the chairman of APH, Dr. Li Chi Long. Behind are doctors from Japan, Hoshii, I think Dr. Nam from Korea, the, Dr. Andal from Japan and Yong Pamo, and right behind, I'm there. Uh, a few APH members, which is a recent photograph taken in Chongqing this year. Uh, this is Dr. Jane from Taiwan. Uh, this is Dr. Okay, Dr. Selva. Myself, Dr. Felix Wong, Dr. Uh, Li Chilong, the chairperson. This is Dr. Hugo Verhoeven from Germany. Okay, the, 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 the subject or the machine we are talking about is uh, produced by the company called Haifu, but actually it is, uh, it looks like an MRI, but it's not an MRI. The patient lies on top of this table face down, prone position, and this is a water container or water tank. Uh, there are a few monitors here. This is the ultrasound monitor. This is the MRI monitor. And together, when we do the surgery or the procedure, we always talk to the patient and we always keep track of the position of the fibroid or the adenomyosis. Let me show you a little clip of uh, the physics behind it. This is sound. So sound has no radiation. An ultrasound beam can be brought to a tight focus at a distance from its source. With sufficient energy concentrated within the focus, the cells lying within so will be killed every without hit, damaging the every surrounding strike tissues. It's about three centimeters high intensity by one centimeter. Ultrasound. Haifu is therefore a non-invasive method of producing selective. Okay, so this is the treatment head. This is the transducer, and this bowl is where it focuses the ultrasound to a beam. To a, to a focal point. Okay. How I got started was in a hot summer in July 2017. Uh, I must say I was very reluctant to go because it's summer and it's very hot in Chongqing. But lo and behold, when I was there, I met a lot of friends from all over the world. In the background, doctors from Spain and Germany, and this is Dr. Anthony from Spain. Dr. Felix Wong and the two doctors, my friends from Thailand. Now, on the first visit there, um, it is the hospital. The whole spa hospital is built around the Haifu technology. This is one of the trainers, and they will show me, and they show me what it is like when you use Haifu to treat a piece of meat. And on this little uh, simple workshop here that we show you. 
how the high fu sound when it focus on the B way from it even when it's above the transducer you, you don't get the burn so what is therapeutic high fu used for it is used for treatment for uterine tissue uterine tumors breast tumors liver especially cancers that are not uh, responding well to chemotherapy pancreas for pain control in those who are not amenable to surgery kidney tumors bone right and of course the prostate in men now in gynecology the focus is on uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. I must say I have no experience on placenta accretor, cesarean section, scar pregnancy, and abdominal wall endometriosis. But in China, they have lots of... This is a picture from laparotomy to laparoscopy or keel surgery, whereby we try to minimize the scars to reduce pain. And the evolution for me, which is very exciting, is from somebody who's trained in basic laparotomy to laparoscopy and now to really, really scarless surgery. Even when we talk about single pot surgery, it's a cosmetic uh, hidden scar. It is not truly a scarless surgery. Now, I then learned there are different versions of therapeutic haifu. I put the adjective therapeutic because very often people get confused with aesthetic haifu. So I'm talking about therapeutic haifu. And there are actually two different machines or two different modes of delivery. One is MRI guided. The other one is ultrasound guided. The difference in MRI guided, uh, resolution is much better. There's a temperature control, but in ultrasound guided, the resolution is poorer. There's no temperature control, but the other advantages are the movement, in other words, the treatment head is much better. The patient can be positioned at different angles, whereas in the MRI high food, the patient is sent into the chamber or the tunnel. So there's limitation of movement of both the transducer and the position of the patient. Of course, there's noise on the MRI machines. Uh, treatment time is longer. For the same fibroid, the treatment time is longer in MRI because the power that they can produce is, is much less than the power that they can produce if you used uh, ultrasound guided high food. Next. They use the terminology called non-perfuse volume. Uh, just take it from me that non-perfuse volume is the degree of ablation of yeah. tissue. Yes. In MRI guided high food, you only have 20 to 50% uh, ablation. But in ultrasound guided high food, it's 80 to 90%. So that's... Uh, is somebody asking me a question? Sorry. Okay, the treatment cost, of course, is higher in MRI guided high food because you occupy the duration of use of the MRI machine compared to an ultrasound high food. Now, what is most important, most interesting to me that uh, I was bowled over is in MRI guided high food, you need the presence of your colleague, which is usually a radiologist. Whereas in ultrasound guided high food, you yourself, a gynecologist or any trained doctor, can perform the surgery. So, in summary, here it was because any gynecologist or any medical doctor can handle the machines that I'm very interested in learning. And this started whole chain reaction, my my top process, and and I think it's going to be a revolution, especially to the younger colleagues. And I am postulating there will be a lot of disruption to the way we operate or treat our patients. 
Now, MRI guided Haifu is produced by two different companies that I know of. One is from USA, and the company is called Insitech. The other company is Philips from Europe. And in total, uh, as of end of December 2018, they have done 4,000 cases worldwide. The ultrasound guided Haifu has been used in more than 26 countries and regions. In total, they have already done 120,000 cases as of end 2018. Whereas 4,000 cases are done from MR, are done with MR guided Haifu. And sometimes when you go into the literature, they would, they were still saying that it's on the research uh, program or it's still a research modality. I'll show you a simple uh, clip of the procedure and you understand how it is done. Just a short one minute video. Patient comes in, patient actually walks in, and this is the bed she lies on in prone position. Once the monitors are set up, notice this is the fibroid, and we check it with an MRI image. This is the MRI image. And this is, this is Dr. Feng, and this is the out live ultrasound uh, monitor. So you notice the doctor is always in communication with the patient. The patient is not under general anesthesia. This is an important uh, arrangement because the patient can feedback to the doctor whether she's feeling pain uh, on the legs or pain on the skin. So it is... Uh, there's a communication. Okay, so why do I learn to use the ultrasound guided Haifu? Because the procedure is done by any doctor. The duration of the ultrasound Haifu procedure is independent of the machine. So the MRI facility can be put to better use. So you don't have to occupy the MRI for two or three hours. So the MRI can be used by your other surgeons or other doctors in the hospital. In so doing, the machine can be housed in a day surgery center, outpatient. And, and in fact, when I visited the Korean colleagues, they, they actually put it on a medical floor in a, in a shopping center. Now, I took one of the early uh, papers. This is done in 2006 to 2009. Uh, this paper is done in uh, Chongqing, the, the university. 757, 57 patients, 1,000 over fibroids. And the size of the fibroid is about 5 to 6 centimeters. They managed to achieve a success ratio of, of ablation about 80%. Anything more than 75% is considered good. And they plot uh, a graph to show that symptoms like pain and menorrhagia it's, has improved after about 6 months. And the size of fibroids, because these this, this are the experts that have done a lot, so they are able to reduce the size of the fibroids by about 50% by six months and about 90% after one to two years. Are there research papers on HIFO in medicine? Actually, plenty. But as you know, most of us are English educated. And I would say some of us are uh, bias in that we only read English uh, journals and literatures. Okay. I put up a few from British Journal of ONG. This is written by a professor in Hong Kong. And there's a paper from Germany. And this is a paper from Japan and so on and so forth. And the most uh, recent paper that came out from UK NICE National Institute of Healthcare has actually stated they now accept ultrasound guided HIFU as a treatment technology for fibroids. Of course, uh, uh, it has a lot of uh, safeguards and cautions of how uh, the doctor on embarking with using HIFU 
should discuss with the patient like all the other mortalities, like all surgeries. Okay, and High Food, the company, has research collaboration with uh, Professor David Crankston. He's the professor of surgery, Oxford University, and he has a team that looks into High Food for gynecology, renal, neurosurgery, breast, pancreas, sarcoma, prostate, and even drug delivery. Um, and I know High Food is now used for palliative treatment of liver cancer, even in uh, Southeast Asia and Myanmar, they're doing it. And I met a young doctor from France. They're using high food now for deep infiltrating endometriosis. Okay, this is a picture uh, taken last year in Chongqing, whereby uh, Professor David Cranston and Dr. Li Qilong signed a memorandum of understanding uh, to cover training, education, research, and certification of Haifu practitioners. Now, what's the advantage? The advantage to us is because as gynecologists or any trained doctor, you need not refer the patients to the interventional radiology. In other words, you do not need to trouble your friends or in x-ray department to sit with you for hours using the MRI machine. As most gynecologists are trained in ultrasound scans, I think adopting HIFU is much easier than, say, picking up laparoscopy. Now, what are the complication rates and side effects? Actually, very low com compared to conventional surgeries for fibroids and adenomyosis. Uh, let me show you this paper, which is written very recent, 2018. They have over 27,000 patients. In other words, not 2,700 patients, but 27,000 patients. And they're able to collect the data of these 27,000 patients. Mm -hmm. Of interest to us as surgeons, we we'll look at, especially laparoscopic surgeons, we we'll look at bowel injury, which I, I see fork out of 27,000 patients, which comes to a, a rate of about 0.048%. I don't see any vessel or blood vessel injury in this group. Now, if I may show you this chart of mine, which I've been using for many years, um, the risk of bowel injury in laparoscopy is about 0.04% to 0.3%. If you compare this with the risk of high food bowel injury, it's 0.01%. In other words, comparatively speaking, anybody doing the conventional surgeries like keyhole or open surgery, you have actually four times more risk or 30 times more risk compared to HIFU. And if you think that by doing an open surgery is safer, that is difference. We, the open surgery colleagues always say that it's dangerous to do laparoscopy, but the truth is in laparotomy, maybe because you can't embark on laparoscopy, you have more bowel adhesions and all this. And so you actually have more Incidents of bowel injury. This is a paper I dug up to show, and, and this is a very recent paper written in 2017. What well, the conclusion is 17, 17 of the 79 patients treated with high food, anti mullerian hormone does not, is not affected. And this is a paper to show that of uh, also in 2017, of the 78 patients that has received HIFU, uh, they achieved 71 percent, uh, 71 live births, and conclusion it, it could significantly reduce the preparation period for pregnancy after HIFU. It can also improve fertility of patients with a history of infertility and normal pregnancy and childbearing with no obstetric risk. Okay, I like this picture. So finally, in July 2018, the sound of the music arrives in Singapore. This is the first uh, patient we did 
with my group of SOG gynecologists on the 16th of July, 2018. Uh, I think my young colleague, Dr. Hong is there. Okay, uh, I I'm halfway through. It shows me I'm halfway through. I'd like to show you this video of my first patient. Uh oh. No, I think it's up to. Oops. I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened to the screen. You can please continue. You can please continue. Okay, Dr. sure. Lee. Sure. Please continue. Sure. The video will be on. It will start. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, that was the first case in 2018 uh, of a patient of mine who have read about Haifu. And this patient uh, is about 41 years old. And she was following uh, another health screening center to screen her, follow on her, the growth of her fibroid. Uh, her fibroid was growing at a rate of about one centimeters every year. Uh, like all good doctors, we will say yes, if you're just growing at one centimeters every year, but it's only about three centimeters. So she was told to observe, which is correct. We all do that when the fibroid is small. Uh, lo and behold, her bleeding, her, man, uh, her periods become heavier and a hemoglobin drop. That's when uh, somebody advised her to remove the fibroid or to remove the womb because um, the, the same story goes, you have finished your, your, your complete your family and think uh, the, the womb is of no necessity to you. But you see, she's a very active person. Well, I try to I was trying to move a bit faster and that's where... Okay. Now, what I want you to see is this green spot. When I fire, it turns red. That means I have activated the fire button and the treatment button. And look at this turning white. And that's what we want to see. That means we have ablated this point. And this point is about 3 mm by 1 mm. This is the bladder and this is the bowel. And look how we managed to get the bowel away from the the line of fire and you can see the assignment in the background of somebody who was walking behind and exclaiming okay i think that's enough we'll go to uh, let me stop this uh, how do i stop this okay let me go to the next slide i mean you can just imagine the excitement i always say uh, I'm, you can just imagine the excitement the excitement is it's like uh scoring your first goal in soccer as a schoolboy or uh, holding a girl's hand for the first time. That is the excitement you get. And this is a pa patient who, the same patient who showed me this picture. I asked her to stay at home for a week. But on the second post of day, I did her on Monday, Wednesday, she went rock climbing. I said, girl, please be careful because this is something I'm not sure of the recovery. I know you're well, but you know, be careful. But it's good for her to show me this. And then five months later, she showed me her snowboarding somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, this is her MRI, which is pre Haifu. Uh, it's about 48 by 37 mm. After about a year, I repeated the MRI. It has shrunk to 30, 38 by 30.7 mm. Frankly, if I use an ultrasound, I could, I could not really make up the delineation of the fibroid. So she was very happy. One year later, her periods are normal, hemoglobin improved. This is a 54 year old lady, has pain and heavy periods due to fibroids. Again, she was uh, being uh, looked after and monitored on the growth of the fibroid until it became about five centimeters and her doctor asked her to remove the womb. Now, 54 years old, in this present day and age, 
is different from 54 years old in the 70s or when I was a medical student. The 54 years old lady dresses like 34 years old and behaves sometimes like 14 years old. So we have to change our concept how we, we advise patients. Nine months later, after Haifu, the fibroid strength, and I just want to repeat the hormone profile because somebody commented at 54 years old, she's likely to go into menopause. So I repeated the hormone profile. It is still like a young lady in early or late 40. So again, really it depends on the patient and the outlook. I think gone are those days where we said the ovaries belong to the pathology department or the formula bottle. I think we have to... Um, tailored our management to change of the times. Okay, so I call this a very disruptive technology. So more women will choose non-invasive surgery over the, the open surgery or MI surgery. Just like years ago, people, would, people like us had switched from MIS to open surgeries, in preference to open surgeries. Then the next, you can do away with the headache of having mosellation and barbed wires for, to stitch the open womb of a fibroid. And in particular, I think this is really a hope for patients with adenomyosis, which has always been a headache to even the very experienced gynecologist. And the fact is true that now, because I don't do IVF, the, my colleagues in IVF department refer the adenomyosis patients to me. So the advantages are straightforward, being no surgery, no incisions, short has hospital stay, no GA, so the patient recovers faster, less or minimal collateral damage, minimal discomfort. And what is important to young ladies is you can preserve the uterine functions. And just for the sake of this uh, webinar, I actually call up uh, the chief of uh, the trainers, Professor Chang Lian, Professor Chang Jian has 60 trainees or trainers under him. Every trainer must have done 1,000 Haifu cases before he become a trainer. So I call him up, I ask him, have you come across any risk of rupture in pregnancy after Haifu? The answer is no. And of course, the patient can go back to exercise and work earlier. Quality of life returns far much faster. And very important for those of you who own hospitals and have their own day surgery centers, the cost is less than an open surgery or myomectomy. And for those patients with fear of surgery, this is a good alternative. And of course, there are no scars. Now, for the hospital administrators, you find that the use of operation rooms is less. You can use it for, for other surgeons. And this is definitely a cost saving to the hospital. You will be using less of surgical instruments and disposables you'll be using less of suture material and you'll be using less of barbed wires. Remember this um, picture? A colleague in America, Amy Reed, dies at the age of 44 because of uh, an undetected fibroid that turns out to be a sarcoma and everybody blames the mosellator. I don't think so because I think it was in good faith that the doctor chose to perform a laparoscopic surgery for her. And unfortunately, it has spread the cancer cells. But let's face it, when we do myomectomy, whether open or laparoscopy, the first thing we do is to cut into the serosa layer to look for the fibroid, and then we enucleate the fibroid. During this process, if it's sarcoma, the cancer cells would have spread like the virus, like the coronavirus. And all these bags are used to mitigate the problem of sarcoma or cancer cell spreads. But I find that it's really genetics to all of us. Surgeries for fibroids and adenomyosis will drop. This is my postulation. Uh, Drugs to reduce the size of fibroids like ulipistrol acetate, I think will be will suffer the usage. Anti-adhesion products 
will not be so well used. Drugs like GNRH agonists will be needed for preparation of the fibroid or the adenomyosis pre and post. MRI will be used by more gynecologists now. The contrast media usage will go up. And these two modalities, radiofrequency and uterine artery embolization, will face competition from the HIFU technology. And all these products, true clear, Bicati, myosia, endometrial ablation, which we use to reduce bleeding or resect submucous fibroid, will be affected. This is a picture of this is a picture of a submucous fibroid. My doctor sent it to me, Dr. Y. G. Tan of Singapore, four centimeters after high food, the fibroid just came out vaginally. This is a picture of a submucous fibroid I did for a nurse, and she showed me the bits and pieces of fibroid that uh, dropped out and she took a picture on the sanitary tower. And this is a very interesting case. 11th of July, 2019, uh, last year, I did the hysteroscopy before HIFU and the only uh, sign of an intramural fibroid anteriorly was this bump here. Even when I released the pressure, this is the intramural fibroid. Nine months later, post HIFU, the intramural fibroid became submucous. It comes down, I think, from here. You can see it. This is the site of it. You can see the angle, the acute angle in which it goes to this, uh, the endometrial layer. Uh, this is the other side of it. Uh, this is the other side of it. And this is from, again, coming down from the top. So what I'm going to do, well, I'm going to wait for it to to uh, string until it's of three centimeters and remove it with a resectoscope. Now, what about our maternal fetal medical ultrasound subspecialists? Our colleagues who uh, prefers to stay out of the operating room and prefers to uh, perform ultrasound. It, will, it is going to be very interesting for them because they are so good with medical ultrasound that I think more of them we jump onto the bandwagon to be a surgeon again without needing to scrub in the former operating theater. So what are the qualities of a high full gynecologist? I've listed a few. If you can have spatial, good spatial orientation as when you drive your car and read the road map, uh, if you have pelvic ultrasound experience, if you have good interpretation of MRI, that will help. Oh, by the way, when I left medical school, I can only know how I only know how to read chest X-rays, abdominal X-rays. This is something new to me, so I pick it up when I uh, learn how to use the Haifu. You must have patience because it's not going to go in and remove the fibroid in less than an hour. You must have patience, and very important to all of us who's in Haifu you must abide by safety guidelines. So you, we cannot afford to have cowboys learning to do high food because if you don't look good in a complication, the rest of us do not know look good at all. Okay, this reminds me I have to move faster. I have last 10 slides. Will high food replace open or minimally invasive surgery? The answer is no. This is my patient again, 40 years old. I treated her for adenomyosis. Six months later, her pain has improved. But again, I'm not happy because the size of the adenomyosis is about the same. Although, although the, the complaints are much better. But because this is diffuse in nature and she's young, probably in about three or four years time, this will regrow. So again, I cannot say uh, high food will treat everything, but in this case, I may need to go in with a uh, laparotomy to either remove the uterus or do a wedge resection of the adenomyosis. So, 
It is good to learn a new procedure as another alternative to offer to patients or just to inform patients that there is another method to treat her fibroid or adenomyosis and to refer to the appropriate high food department. This, I always say, is the spirit of good doctoring. Long ago, as physicians, that's how we listen to chest sounds. In the Victorian era, is how we palpate gynecologically. And Dr. Leonard, a French physician, used a tube to listen to chest sounds and was only 132 years later that the, the tube became our modern day stethoscope, 132 years. The history of Haifu started briefly in 1988. Professor Wang sets up a research team uh, on Haifu application in Chongqing. It was not until year 2000 that Haifu was approved by Chinese government to treat tumors. In fact, the first few treatment was on cancer of the bones. This is Professor Wang Zipiao. So from 1988 to 2000, just a span of 12 years, he's able to, to convert a natural knife found in, in nature in Chongqing to a modern Haifu virtual knife for the benefit of women. So in conclusion, this is my last slide. And I believe for the preservation of femininity and fertility, right now, Haifu is an excellent alternative for the treatment of fibroids and adenomyosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lee. It Thank was you. an excellent presentation given by you. And we are very thankful to you for a wonderful overview of the medical Chongqing University and explaining the details of Haifu, how it was founded by Professor Wong and how we have taken it to the pinnacle heights. And I'm very happy to share with the viewers that we have got more than 5,100 viewers from all these countries. Oh my God, it has gone, I would like to correct, 5,600 viewers. And they are not only from India, but they are from all these countries which have been with us. I would like to name them Algiers, Singapore, China, France, Senegal, Belgium, Tunisia, Mali, Morocco, Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and this is great. So we will get back to you, sir, very soon with the questions. Now I welcome Dr. Narendra Malotra. We call him Dr. NM. NM, sir. The mic is yours to present your wonderful presentation eagerly. All of them are waiting for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diranjan. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me here to, to be a part of this great uh, webinar. Uh, I am indeed indebted to uh, all of you and uh, to this webinar and to so many people who are here listening to all of us uh, here. Today, as you all heard, it's Earth Day. It's 22nd of April, the 50th Earth Day celebration. And we are celebrating a lockdown. The Earth is locked down by this stupid virus called Corona. And we got to beat, uh, beat this virus somehow. How is, is the big, big question which we got to the only way it will work is stay at home, stay safe, let the Corona warriors work, the rest of you please stay home. So uh, today I will be talking on medical management of the uterine fibroids, something uh, in addition or in uh, leaving the surgery behind. We, we all are very knife happy people, the gynecologists, and the minute a patient is told you have a fibroid, Usually, we don't look at the size, anything. And the patient also is being told that you have a fibroid. She will immediately rush to a gynecologist or to a surgeon and demand an operation. And usually, they demand for a hysterectomy. Remove it. 
So in India, the prevalence of fibroids is about 37.6% in rural population and 24% in urban population. And significant symptoms are seen in more than 25% of the women. We all know the risk factors, increasing age before menopause uh, and uh, early menarche, if it occurs less than 10 years, family history, nulliparity, high BMI, all that. We have to understand, if you have, want to understand the, uh, the medical management, we have to understand the pathophysiology. We know that the fibroid will occur when a single uterine smooth muscle will, or a connective tissue will replicate until it forms a cluster of cells and then forms a mass, which is different from the normal nearby musculature. It has genetic factors, so it runs in families, and majorly it has hormonal factors. So estrogen, progesterone receptors, uh, then normal uterine tissue, and therefore these areas become more sensitive to these two hormones, and then they develop. So fibroid developing is influenced by hormones, progesterone and uh, progesterone receptors along with genetic factors and disturbance of the aromatase uh, pathway and that leads to a most significant factor. So progesterone and its receptors hence represent a very potential target for inhibiting growths of myomas. So that is where the treatment uh, will hold good to. So let's see if you have a symptomatic fibroid, we can offer them medical treatment which is non-hormonal or hormonal. That's one pathway. We offer them surgical treatment, which could be open or laparoscopic myomectomy or hysterectomy. Or we could offer them endometrial ablation, TCRE, for uh, correcting the menorrhagia and hysteroscopic myomectomy if it is submucous. Or we can offer them other modalities, which we have so beautifully just heard Dr. Lee describe magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound surgery or ultrasound guided high food plus UAE that is uterine artery embolization so that 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 also can be offered now the current therapies which are available are they satisfactory for us the management of symptomatic fibroid has been surgical as I've been telling you all of us are knife happy and we need go ahead and remove as small as fibroids and we know that there is no medical treatment which will completely eliminate the fibroid However, alternate pharmacological treatments have been proposed to control the symptoms. And the choice will depend on age, parity, childbearing, extent and severity, size and number of myomas, proximity of menopause, and risk of malignancy. So we can divide the treatment into expectant and definitive. The expectant treatment is that you have a clinical option for asymptomatic fibroid, a uh, scheduled periodic annual evaluation and monitor the progression. So if she wants to conceive, she has a small intramural fibroid or maybe two of them or a subserious fibroid, just leave them alone, monitor them every year. Or you have a definitive treatment which depends on the symptom, size, location and the patient age, preservation of fertility, preservation of uterus, availability of the therapy and experience all to be taken into account on what to do. So the management options for symptomatic fibroids would be they can be treated medically, surgically, or in combination of both. And we have a lovely algorithm where the fibroid is being diagnosed by physical examination or ultrasound in symptomatic or asymptomatic. So we divide them into asymptomatic, so it was diagnosed incidentally. And here again, we divide them into less than 14 week size uterus, more than 14 week size. If it is less than 14 week size uterus, you could put these women, if they're asymptomatic, and want to conceive into an expected management. Just follow it with periodic evaluation. But if it is more than 14 weeks, then of course we discuss the options. And there is an option of medical management here and an option of surgery to be discussed. While if the fibroid is symptomatic, they, you have a choice of medical management or a choice if the patient wants to conceive or infertile, then we have a choice of leaving it alone with expectant management. But if the fibroid is submucous and distorting the cavity, then we got to remove it hysteroscopy. No, no confusion there. No confusion in infertility. Surgery if it is big or surgery if it is intra or uh, submucous.
if it is symptomatic and not a very big fibroid and the patient is not wanting surgery right now or you want to try then you can offer medical treatment currently many medical treatment we will we'll just discuss but here i'm in my algorithm there are only two jnrh analogs or uliprostal and if this fails then the patient goes to surgery so i would have an algorithm something like that now let's see what are the medical treatments available to us firstly we have to remember as you can see in the blue square no medical treatment will completely eliminate the fiber please keep that in mind no medical treatment completely eliminates a fibroid you have uh, anti prostaglandins if there is pain you have gnrh agonist to suppress ovulation and suppress the estrogen progesterone we have progesterone pills to uh, take care of the bleeding we have oral contraceptive pills again to take care of the bleeding menorrhagia and um, the fibroid we have progesterone releasing iucds which we can put and of course we will now discuss progesterone receptor modulators selective progesterone receptor modulators and selective estrogen receptor modulators which would help the aim of the medical management is that you want to control the menorrhagia you want to improve the hemoglobin before surgery so iron therapy is uh, to be given and the drugs to be tried are if the patient is bleeding anti fibrinolytic agents gnrh therapy danazol big red not recommended now because danazol in the right dose 600 to 800 mg daily will cause irreversible symptoms masculinizing symptoms to women so they'll cause facial hair which will never go away and they'll cause a very hoarse voice so i we don't want the women to have very hoarse voice so that that we don't want that so that is our clomiphene citrate the role is uh, questionable it is a serum but the role is questionable ocps yes they might work to regulate the bleeding but the fibroids sometimes grow lng iu series if the uterus is not very big yes it might work nacids for pain and progesterone um, receptor modulators or progestogens or progesterone like mifepristone or norit nor derivatives they they are used to regulate the bleeding and control the bleeding and of course uliprostal so fibroid growth is hormone dependent medical treatments will mainly involve the hormone manipulation objectives of man, uh, medical treatment we already told you we want to improve the anemia correct the men menorrhagia and make the patient fit for surgery or those patients who are not fit for surgery they go only on men um, on medical treatment in perimenopausal women or high risk women and in selected cases of infertility we reduce the size of the fibroid for a hysteroscopic or a laparoscopic to improve the hysteroscopic or laparoscopic cell so to drugs used to reduce the blood anti progesterones mifepristone danazol no big no gnrh analogs agonist antagonist agonist depots yes antagonist depot not yet available so we are not using that lng ius yes in smaller size uterus prostaglandin synthetase inhibitors only if there is pain and progestogens uh, progesterone receptor modulators and selective progesterone receptor modulators in the others so a quick one slide each on each one of them we have already seen this uh, the instead of medical management uh, the patients who can go in for uterine artery uh, embolization which is a complicated procedure and which will require uh, a radiologist and you can see that uh, this is catheterized into the uterine artery and polyvinyl particles are then injected into the anterior branch or even to the branches supplying the fibroids and will cause fiber hifu such a beautiful lecture on hifu and i will not go into the details but these two are there which are non surgical treatment available to certain set of patients or certain group of patients anti progesterone mifepristone are you 486 anti abortion pill or whatever now this is used to reduce the fibroid size and also the menorrhagia in the dose of 25 to 30 mg but recommended for 3 months long time okay Dr. Naranjan, are you there? Yeah, hi guys. There, I think uh, we have lost the connection from Dr. Narendra Malhotra. So we will wait for him to get back. Oh, and we have our special guest, Dr. Manjula Nagani. Who I doesn't know Dr. Manjula? Yeah, 
वेलकम शी इज अवर पद्मश्री शी इज फ्रॉम हैदराबाद शी इज अटैच टू अ वेरी मेजर हॉस्पिटल एंड मैडम थैंक यू सो मच फॉर एक्सेप्टिंग द इनवाइट अमंग्स योर बिजी शेड्यूल आई थिंक टू वीक्स अगो आई वॉज विथ योर कलीग Uh, from medical intensive department and we yes. just missed you that time so uh, well there are many questions which have been there and yes. i would like to say now uh, madam and sir that narendra malhotra sir will join us very soon we are just expecting the line to be coming the topic was actually the use of medical management and such a wonderful presentation dr lee has uh, made it in a very simplified manner how you can go ahead and treat and we would like to take some few questions madam before that i would yes. request you to please comment on both the lectures for 5 minutes and then we'll right. go to the question answer session till the time dr narendra right. mantra will join us thank you dr niranjan it was a very lucid and impressive lecture by dr lee on hifo so what i just want to take a take home messages would be right hifo like its name says it is highly focused so it has to be very precisely managed otherwise the temperature which goes between 59 degrees to 83 degrees centigrade we need to be very careful about sparing the surrounding tissues so the two main actions of hifo like dr lee said is the coaptation leading to thermal uh, necrosis and cavitation leading to apoptosis so So the selection of cases is very very important, Dr. Niranjan. So what according yeah. to Nice, what is important is symptomatic. Dr. Lee very clearly and very impressively showed a photograph where the the fibroid has been expelled. So and we have to remember that the size decreases only by forty percent. So if you are treating the report or treating the ultrasound picture, you might not see the exact difference. Whereas the symptoms would be definitely improved. So so and we also have to remember that the fibroid should not be more than twelve centimeters in size, and it has to be less than five numbers. And uh, we have to be where no uh, no pressure uh, effects. These are the few things which we have to remember, and also the limitations. which has been told already to us is that we have to do one fibroid at a time and there is no tissue biopsy so we are always worried about the sarcoma 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 so when we know there is no tissue for biopsy we have to look at the other factors like age ldh and mri where there is no necrosis if there is already necrosis hypo is not going to help us at all because it uh, if it's only symptomatic we have to look at that and the ultrasound or the mri shows no necrosis if there is lot of necrosis these are not the ideal candidates for this question for this procedure so and dr lee also suggested that there are there are studies going on about the die that is deep infiltrating endometriosis so i'm i'm sure waiting for the future of, uh, about use of transrectal utilization of it in that die especially involving the uh, rectum and the um, uh, sigmoid junction and also for vulval dystrophies and i i know that uh, most of the patients when asked they would always opt for a non surgical option and the best part of the hifo is that we are do dealing with it so when gynecologists treat it and we are we are happy to deal with our side effects and the side uh, and the complications rather than the procedure being done by a radiologist and the patient come to us with bleeding of the and the fibroids coming out so i think the as far as hifo is concerned all the gynecologists who are trained in ultrasound should be going training themselves get trained and be ready to take care of the non surgical treatment and the next lecture which has actually been started very well by dr narendra malhotra about the medical management i'm sure will be going ahead with a better way i think uh, what we have to understand about medical like i already said is that any surgical option patient would always want to try a medical option before they think it is necessary uh, to go for surgery they want to avoid everything and now the pathophysiology has been evolving and we now know it is nothing to do with estrogen and it is something to do with the path uh, progesterone pathway it is logical for us to think that any medicine will work which will work with the uh, progesterone modulation receptor modulation will work wonders so that's where of all the medical management the two medicines which have come forward as the medical management which has really come forward would be one is sprms that is uli crystals and all the um, anacy crystals and all that the so second one will be aromatase inhibitors that would be like uh, uh, when we start using letrozole for before giving the surgery especially in uh, uh, hysteroscopic myomectomy i think dr narendra is coming online so we will go ahead with his lecture oh wonderful welcome dr narendra malhotra yeah i'm very sorry the power just got cut and uh, i had not put it on the backup so yes, i'm uh, i'm very sorry about that uh, okay so we were at the medical treatment on what uh, what 
एंटी प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन सो एंटी प्रोजेस्ट्रॉन वी टॉक अबाउट मिजो मिफिप्रोस्ट्रॉन बट नॉट यूज वेरी वाइडली Dinazol, as I told you, because of the masculinizing side effects, absolutely no to this drug, and we are not going to use any Dinazol uh, now. GnRH agonist in depot preparations, Gosarlin, Lupirlin, Brusarlin, Nafrolin, all of them can be used. But the disadvantage about GnRH agonist is that they will cause menopausal symptoms and bone marrow depression. Antagonists, cetrolex or ganrolex. The depot preparations we are waiting. As soon as we get the prostate cancers, and also for us, it might be helpful. The advantages of analogs are that the menorrhagia improves, and there is improvement of anemia. There is relief of pressure symptom. The fibroid size reduces by fifty percent uh, if we use for six months. There is reduction of the vascularity of the tumor. Reduction of the blood loss during myomectomy. and uh, it makes the surgery easy the only problem is the planes are lost so sometimes the dissection becomes very difficult so the myoma enucleation becomes very difficult plus it will give you all the menopausal uh, symptoms plus for 6 months the cost is a lot and then uh, bmd bone loss and all that uh, is there what about nsaids uh, prostaglandin synthetase inhibitors only to relieve pain and they cannot improve menorrhagia due to fibroids so they are given with anti fibrinolytic with combination uh, with mefenamic acid yes maybe during the menstrual period uh, the bleeding is little bit reduced and the pain is reduced uh, lng if the fibroid size is less than 14 weeks so let's say 12 weeks then yes otherwise uh, we will need to do another treatment so all these medical therapies have their own own uh, drawbacks ocps have drawbacks lng has drawbacks agonist depots have drawbacks and we cannot um, have uh, then use uh, very frequently so the demerits of these medical treatment which we had they are expensive for long term the fibroid starts growing immediately when you stop it there is difficulty in establishing a surgical plane between the fibroid and the tissue when you give them analogs and menopausal signs and symptoms so uh, the newer way of pathology as uh, dr manila was also discussing during the breakdown time is that progesterone plays a vital role in promoting uterine fibroid and we need to target these receptors uh, which are the progesterone which are fibroids which are progesterone sensitive fibroid so here you have the estrogen molecule and the progesterone molecule the estrogen receptor binding was twice as the progesterone receptor binding i uh, was three times higher in the fibroid in the my myometrium so so you see here it's the progesterone which now is thought to play a big role while both of them have uh, an effect on on the binding uh, in the fibroid so progesterone has a dual action on fibroid growth first it will stimulate the growth by upregulating regulating the epidermal growth factors which is egf and bcl2 bcl uh, lymphoma lymphoma is a key protein for inhibition of apoptosis so that will be affected then progesterone brown regulates the tumor necrosing factor alpha tnf expression so we if we remember that then we we, we will know that if we have something which will selectively modulate this progesterone receptors that will form a ideal therapy so the role of progesterone in promoting fibroid growth is known and it has stimulated a lot of interest in modulating the progesterone pathway and thus sperms that is selective progesterone receptor modulators are now coming out as an innovative therapy in the uterine fibroid uh, um, management so what are the selective uh, progesterone receptor modulators or some of them are called as only progesterone receptor modulators like mifeprostone it is uliprostol acetate aspronil and uh, telaprostone acetate which have been investigated now they decrease the size they reduce the bleeding uh, they can let women have uh, fertility so enjoy childbirth after the therapy uh, natural pregnancies and all that so they have a lot of advantage so let's see how they do it now sperms are agonist to the pr and they are antagonist to the progesterone receptor so act in both dual and then they will cause an rna pol2 transcription activation and they will block this will block the transcription activation and the 
uh, PR ligands displaying the selective agonist antagonist mixed activity of the target cells. So that that will take care of the growth of the fibroid. So aspirinol was used with great success, but and uh, as a progesterone receptor modulator, and it does not uh, cause endometrial hyperplasia. But then more research went to uliprostol. And let's see what, what uliprostol is all about. So we have the other molecule, which is uliprostol acetate. It causes reversal blockage of the progesterone receptors, reversible. So once you stop, the receptors start from binds to the progesterone receptors, but not with the estrogen. So no hypoestrogenic condition, no menopausal bone loss, all that. No affinity to the mineralocorticoids uh, receptors. So it does not affect the whole body. And the action is only on the fibroid cells and not on the normal myometrial cells. That's the beauty. It has an approval of every, uh, almost everything. It went into dispute with an RCOG uh, statement saying that it causes eight cases in that study called caused liver damage. Yes, that caution has to be taken. Patient has to have an LFT before. Only uh, those without a deranged liver function uh, should be put on uh, uniprostol acetate uh, therapy. How does it work? It has a potent anti-progesterone action directly on the fibroid. So it shows a pro-apoptic uh, action, decreasing the BCL2, which I just showed you, also decreases the size and the volume of the fibroid. It acts on the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, decreases LH and FSH, so inhibits ovulation. This drug is also used uh, as an emergency uh, contraceptive pill in the dose of 30. Here we are talking in the dose of 5. So on the endometrium, it shows an anti-proliferative action. So it causes, induces amenorrhea. So it's got a three, three-fold action. And the clinical benefits would be it'll correct the anemia. It will reduce the intraoperative blood loss after uliprostol therapy. It will reduce the operative time. It will reduce the need of blood transfusion. And instead of hysterectomy, myomectomy will work here. And the patients uh, will be uterine conservation surgery can be done. So it reduces the fibroid volume, corrects anemia, and allows a less invasive surgery to be performed. We have the MI, how it was there, and the PMI study outcomes uh, given before surgery, 12 months following treatment. You see 39 patients who underwent surgical procedure during the 12 months, and 42 patients uh, percent in this study did not need. They all were for surgery, and they were put on the pre-operative uliprostol. And 42% uh, did not need the surgery because they got uh, they got improved. So the clinical benefits of uliprostol introduced before scheduled surgery are now absolutely proven. Also, the advantage is that it does not disturb the surgical planes. So laparoscopic shelling out of the fibroid becomes easier as it was, not like GnRH analogs where the planes are lost. Uh, who says so? 2017, Ashray, Venus 2 uh, study and Venus uh, 2 studies were presented. Uh, US based phase 3 studies on uliprostol acetate for treatment of symptomatic and for treatment of symptomatic fibroids uh, in a dose of 5 and later in the phase 3 studies in the dose of 10 also. And it said that numerically greater response in efficacy was observed with both the 5 and the 10. And the quality of life with uliprostol acetate treatment of symptomatic uterine fibroids, the quality of life improves much more. The score, UFS, QOLs, quality of life, subscale score improves and the woman leads a normal life if, if they were put with, with symptomatic fibroids. Uliprostol acetate treatment with symptomatic uterine fibroids, the Venus 2 subgroup, uh, is not related to race and BMI. So all women were uh, responding same. So what would be our indication and dose? Our indication and dose would be symptomatic management of uterine fibroids, pre-operative to reduce one tablet, five milligram to be started in the first week of menstrual cycle, preferably day four of the menses or day five, and given continuously for three months, and then stopped for a month and restarted for the next cycle, repeat course from day four again. And first course and second course and four courses like this. So 12 weeks therapy with a one month break, uh, break in between each therapy. The side effects were hot flushes and headaches, but very less in very, very few women. 
The contraindication, of course, pregnancy, genital bleeding of unknown origin, hypersensitivity due to any drug, uterine, cervical, ovarian, breast cancers. Special warnings if the patient is on contraception, renally impaired, hepatic impairment was the biggest warning. So LFT has to be done and every three months LFT has to be monitored. And if you see a deranged LFT, the drug has to be stopped. Asthmatic patient, endometrial changes, concomitant, other drugs being used and bleeding pattern of the patient should be kept in mind. Now we had this great PEARL study. PEARL is P, that is the drug, PGL4001, which is uniprostal acetate. E is efficacy, A is assessment, R is reduction of symptoms due to uterine, L is leomyoma. And PEARL1, PEARL2, PEARL3, PEARL4, uh, in phase 3, the conclusions, as you can see, 13 weeks, effectively controlled bleeding. Both 5 and 10 milligrams, very, very good. Better than lubronide acetate. Repeated 3-month courses of oral UPA, 10 milligram, very effective in controlling bleeding and pain. QOL, much better. Quality of life, much better. And uh, PEARL4, efficacy and safety of repeated use of uliprostol and uterine. So repeated 12-week courses with oral 5 or 10 controls it and is safe and improves the quality of life in all the symptoms. And these were done as efficacy analysis. I'm not going to go into these details. Uh, they were done as time to persistent amenorrhea. They were done as safety analysis and it was pretty safe as a conclusion. And the endpoints was uh, evaluated as efficacy endpoints and safety endpoints. So serum estradiol levels, proportion of patients, suffering hot flushes, lab assessment, bone markers, endometrial thickness, OE. Those were the safety endpoints which were taken uh, in this. Pearl 2 studies compared, as I showed you there, compared with luprolide acetate. And once a day, oral 5, once a day 10, with 3.75 luprolide acetate once a month. And then surgery. So it was shown that the uliprostol uh, patients fared, fared better. And this is what the study showed, the long-term effects of treatment of uterine fibroids with uliprostol acetate. First three months, second three months, third three months, fourth three months. Enrolled premenopausal women with at least one fibroid, more than three, and non, none of them more than 10. With more than 10, surgery is better. It, is, it was double-blinded and compared with NETA, that is norethitron acetate, 10 milligrams, uh, twice or thrice a day. And the red spots are the menses bleeding. And there, the efficacy was, was studied. And it was seen that it was safe. Uh, ovarian uh, problems were not there. Hematology was not there. Estrogen levels were not there. No cases of endometrial hyperplasia. 10 days treatment with norethitron did not affect uh, significantly the treatment outcome. So, and then it was compared with the first series of 18 pregnancies um, after universal treatment for uterine fibroids. So these patients were followed up and they got pregnant on their own. And it was seen that the fibroid did not increase in size during the pregnancy. So that showed that there was a long-term effect of uliprostol, even after stopping, stopping the drug, even when the patient got pregnant uh, on the effect of the fibroid. So no regrowths of fibroids occurred during the pregnancy uh, in this study, reported in fertile cell. cell. Uh, also, this uh, the endpoint analysis with volume, cessation of bleeding, hemoglobin recurrence, it showed that 26 patients out of the 56 did not require surgery at all. They did not require. The long-term treatment of uterine fibroid with uliprostol acetate, again, a woman with heavy menstrual bleeding, all biopsy showed benign reversible changes, volume reduction 50%, amenorrhea 79% after the first course. So it, it, it works in the first month. Then we had the NICE guidelines for less than three and more than three centimeter size fibroid. LNG, uh, antifibrinolytic, NSAIDs, or progesterones. More than three, then you, you need to give 12 week course of uliprostol. That would work much better if the fibroid is, is bigger. So the nice recommendation of more than three and less than three, uliprostol and surgery if it is big and the others can be tried if, if the fibroid is less. So ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, here is an option in the form of an oral capsule for the management of symptomatic fibroids. 
which will preserve the uterus, which will improve the fertility, which will improve the quality of life, which can be used prior to surgery for improving your surgical outcomes, which can be used safely in perimenopausal women, in women with relapse after myomectomies, to control the symptoms, to decrease the size of the fibroid, to change the course of our operation from a hysterectomy to myomectomy, and also laparoscopy, it does not affect because of the planes, and it is well tolerated. Of course, a lot of other drugs, uh, herbal drugs in India, China uh, are available and Hong Kong, but they are not scientific. They are not being tried, but they are available online for anything. Thank you very much for inviting me here and uh, letting me express some of my views on the medical management of fibroids. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. Dr. Narendra Malhotra, you covered the use of uliprestol, use of mifepristone and the new kid on the block and also explained regarding the Paul study and Paul trial 3, 4 and obviously it was a wonderful presentation where you are given the overview of how to go about. Now we have got more than 200 questions but before I go to 200 questions I request Dr. Mahindra to please continue with your comments sir was not there and obviously you talked about Dr. Lee. So the mic is yours madam. Thank you, Dr. Niranjan. I just have to add three points to what Dr. Narendra has very well clearly told us. So first is about uh, pre-operative when we are doing it. We should we have to give it for one cycle before the surgery. And when it is therapeutic, it is four cycles. So that is one point everybody has to remember. The second thing is, yes, during the surgery, your planes will be clear. But what we have to understand, if we end up doing myomectomy, is there is lysis of the center of the fibroid. So when we are removing the uh, removing the fibroid, it will become very difficult for us if you are using morselation. So in bag morselation is something which you have to practice if you are doing the surgery after the ulipristal usage. And the third point which I just wanted to add is that there is something called PAEC, that is progesterone associated endometrial changes. We have to know that because in India we have start people have started using the ulipristal a lot. You have, you don't see it usually usually out of India, but here they are using quite a bit. So there is something called PAEC that endometrial changes you get with all SERMs and SPRMs also, which will look as a thickened endometrial lining and the ultrasound associated with amenorrhea. So don't get worried. It is only temporary thing and it will shed. Otherwise, I think I'm very sure all the audience of 5,600, whoever has come online, have learned a lot about the non-surgical treatments of the fibroid. Yeah. Thank you, uh, madam. Now we have got questions which are coming. I think we will go... Uh, uh, back to uh, Dr. Narendra Malhotra before we ask questions to Dr. Lee. Uh, sir, now there are certain issues regarding this uh, medical management. So we would like to, uh, obviously you have explained us in the presentation, but there are questions which have been asked that what is the criteria for using this medical line of treatment? I mean, most of us are comfortable with laparoscopic surgery or hysteroscopic surgery and we have been totally surgically oriented. We are not that much proponent as compared to any other country. But, but now this is the new kid on the block, which is also there. And obviously, I will go to Haifu, uh, Dr. Lee. But I want some comments from you that how would you change this perspective? So as in the beginning, I said in India, gynecologists are knife uh, happy. Uh, even a two centimeter fibroid, they will go ahead and remove it. Surgically. Yes. So that, that is our major problem. If one gynec does not remove, the other will remove. Or even a general surgeon or a laparoscopic, which is a major. And they'll do a hysterectomy for a 2 centimeter fibroid. Uh, because they feel that uh, the women will not come for follow-up and things like that. So we have to change that attitude. We have a medical treatment uh, which uh, is has long-term effects. Uh, and the treatment, after stopping the treatment, it, uh, the effect continues. Uh, and uh, there are some some set which are not operable. There it is clear, very large fibroids, very clear surgery is required. It is the small fibroids, less than three centimeters, which should be tried medically first, and then family complete. And as I clearly said, medical treatment will not make the fibroids vanish. So it's not a complete treatment of fibroids. You are only giving symptomatic relief, and you are reducing it. Family complete, everything complete. She gets her symptoms. One more repeat uh, therapy, one more course. She gets it repeatedly again, do surgery. So so that, that is how we should follow. 
thank you sir for your wonderful uh, i mean scientific comments which are there i am sure uh, the approach towards fibroid will change to a certain extent now i come back to dr lee hello dr lee it was a wonderful mm -hmm. presentation we have got more than 200 uh, questions which have been asked here obviously i am not going to bombard with so many questions to you but i am going to filter them and i would also like to uh tell all of you that there are now 6268 doctors who are logged i think we have broken all the history of records of live webinar with such esteemed uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, speakers and manjula madam being there with us people are just crazy about academics and it's not only that they are just more interested in doing something else so we come back to question dr lee now haifu is a is something which is very new in india and we want to get those machines in india obviously it will take some time but we want the uh, the answer from you is to what extent you can go and use this haifu up till what centimeter of size of fibroid or beyond it we cannot use it or we should not use it oh, okay my first comment on the whether the machine is available in india or not yes i think uh i've met some companies marketing the machines and this is a, a company from india and actually met them in hong kong um but then i was not really interested because it is a mri guided haifu in other words i really have to depend on uh mri whenever i perform uh, haifu secondly your second question is what's the size of the fibroid uh one can take really uh for a start i really hope that i have the easy ones like uh 3 to 5 cm with uh some mild complaints or symptoms like bleeding or just uh, pain but the moment you start on a case of uh haifu for the chosen few that that you have been watching them the rest will come because of more word of mouth and and the funny thing is ironically the difficult cases started coming in other words you you have a lot of patients who are uh, been uh, cared for by your other colleagues and the typical example is uh, 3 cm weight 4 cm weight and then when it becomes 7 to 8 cm uh, i think you better remove your your whole uterus this became a shocker to many of the Ladies. So, question is what is the biggest I I have done? Uh, the youngest I've done, uh, twenty twenty two years old. The biggest I've done is uh, a fibroid that has reached the belly button. Again, whenever I counsel patients for high four, I always tell them, look, there's no promise the whole fibroid will disappear. The main uh, message I give to the patient is this may not completely go away because it will it will never completely go away there will always be fibrous tissue uh grouped together left behind so the the biggest the bigger it is you will take a longer time to do you really test your patients remember the one the point i said is patients are very important and i think dealing with fibroids with haifu should never be a guinness book of records a challenge to see who has done bigger um as in laparotomy or or laparoscopic surgery so do the simple ones first until you're competent uh with not just uh the treatment process the science of it how you manage your machines how you counsel your patients and always tell them that you may take anything from 1 hour to 4 hours because you actually attack the fibroid by millimeters to millimeter so on the day when you are tired just after doing a a, a delivery in the middle of the night i don't think you should do the big ones however as doctors you know we can't choose patients just come to your doorstep even now with the covid uh uh virus on and we are not supposed to see uh non essential patients the bleeding ones will come the painful ones will come and and we just have to handle them so the biggest i've done so far is up to the belly buttons but there's one that is 
higher than the belly button, which I am going to stop her bleeding first with GnRH. Her hemoglobin is down. So that gives me time to say that, look, the, uh, whatever it is, whether it's surgery or non-surgery, make sure your hemoglobin is up first before we do GnRH. And as you know, when you give GnRH, the first 10 days, there's a reactionary bleeding. And that's where I fear that if you're coming to see me with a hemoglobin of six, and then you have a reaction bleeding on day 10, it may drop to a day HB of four or five, that's good for you. So I'm very careful about this. And I think all my colleagues are, are the same, uh, uh, share the same sentiments. So uh, I wish the typical fibroid uh, that the first paper written by in Chongqing, they have been doing on just five to six centimeters first. From the start, do the easy ones first. When you have to do the difficult ones, you should get somebody more experienced to sit next to you. Okay. That's my take on high food. Dr. Narendra Malhotra, after that, Dr. Manjula, please give your comments on Dr. Lee's answer. I, I totally agree. La very large fibroids uh, should not be attempted for medical treatment and even uh, high food, unless the patient is... Uh, not cannot have surgery or the hemoglobin is very low. Absolutely yes. Uh, we we it, uh, see if we have a modality, it does not mean uh, that we should know the we should know how to draw lines and where to draw lines. Yeah, and yeah, and, yeah. and my take um, is all the T's. First is a technique. You should master your technique. Second, whenever a technology comes, you should get proper training. When train your team and finally your temperament, like Dr. D said, after whole work is over and then you jump onto it and do it and your temperament, you know, you can just can go for a fuse. So I think have your the right time when you're learning early in the morning, you train yourself, learn your technology and then go ahead. But nice guidelines is 12 centimeter, do not cross it initially. So I think that's fine. So I think 12 centimeter would be the cutoff point where anything yes. about 12 centimeter, you can uh, surely uh, go ahead and... Uh, you know, uh, not do right. this. But but uh, obviously, Dr. Lee has got more experience. He has done more than 1,000 cases and he has been practicing this for so many years, two decades. So, uh, and nowadays, uh, yeah, sorry, Madam, please go ahead. No, no. Perfect, Navin. Yeah. So, uh, wonderful, uh, Dr. Manjula and uh, Narendra Malhotra, sir, also is acknowledging the technology training team and temperament. And uh, we all agree that this is very important. And I would like to share here that I, I got just before the lockdown, two ladies, they were very young, about 25, 23 years. They were unmarried and they had come with fiancé. Obviously, uh, they were not married and she had fibroid about 8 to 10 centimeter. She had a lot of concern about laparoscopic uh, removal of that fibroid. She wanted more of uh, medical management. She asked that I have been referred to you, sir, that we, we have got this ultrasound department and whether we do. So, yes, we have one machine, which is the MRI actually, and they are doing that. So, I had to counsel her, explain her, and then we had to refer her to uh, undergo that ultrasound treatment of uh, high focused uh, modality for uh, removing and after three months she was very happy and she got married so i think that is also a very important young women young girls are not uh, that much uh, comfortable of doing a laparoscopic surgery maybe it might be different when you are about 35 or 40 and obviously the perimenopausal what do you feel dr narendra and dr uh, uh, Ananda, Ananda. Ananda. yes Narendra, you are taking it first or? No, no, I think, I think you take this. Yeah, my take is actually, you know, like I said, no medical management or even any non-surgical will not make the fibroid disappear. We should be very, very clear in explaining to them. So perimenopausal patients who go for this master health checkups and then they see this ultrasound, which is showing three centimeter, four centimeters, and they're worried, worried, worried about, about it. Those are the patients who can try this. That is first thing. And preoperative is another thing which you can always say where we can avoid surgeries or we might end up but having a better outcomes of the surgery. And like you said, pre-married um, or whatever young girls who are scared. So it is always the patient who comes as the first choice who have to take, but they have to be symptomatic for them to be happy. Otherwise, the ultrasound again after three months shows only one centimeter decrease, four through centimeters decrease, they are never going to be happy. So symptomatic and your technology you have mastered it and you are going to, they have the time to wait for almost one year 
So it is not just after three months, four months, the size is going to disappear. So it will take eight months to nine months to decrease the some notable size and the uh, and the symptoms to improve. So patient who is cooperative. who is symptomatic and who is uh, going to be a very um, compliant patient i think i would choose those patients over anybody who is in a hurry to get anything done thank you doctor so that is what my algorithm had shown that is what my algorithm has shown yes, take yes. the patients take the patient's age her desire her fertility her age and her child bearing and her family complete keep that in mind you divided into asymptomatic symptomatic because they are picked up routinely in some routine ultrasound totally asymptomatic 3 cm nothing to be done yearly follow up one year not every month an ultrasound which which says the, the fibroids not vanishing and then someone will do an operative treatment on her only symptomatic then you offer them uh, medical treatment or surgical treatment depending on what their situation is dr narendra there is one question for you how many months can we give ulipristol and what is the duration of the and the dose for this uh, medical management in case of fibroid which is approximately 5 cm in size this question has come from philippines so 5 mg a day starting day 4 or 5 of the menstrual period for 3 months one menstrual cycle break then another 3 months one menstrual cycle break another 3 months and one menstrual cycle break another 3 months four courses of 3 months each is uh, so 12 weeks is your complete dose schedule uh, for uh, 5 or 10 the 5 or 10 uh, the results are same and monitor lft every 3 months wonderfully explained i think dr anugani is also acknowledging the same uh, sequence of uh, treatment to be given to our patients and it has been wonderfully explained by you now i come back to dr lee uh, there are many many questions to you sir because now this has open a new window in uh, pan india and in sar countries which your lecture has gone about more than 6200 members being seen now professor lee uh, whether we should give any medical management before we start this settings of high focus ultrasound this question is uh, being there by dr arun arun dhat from thailand okay sure uh, uh, unfortunately unfortunately uh, ulipristol acetate has been withdrawn from singapore uh, because of some uh, issues with europe and uh, and also because of the the worry about the uh, Uh, liver function so uh we have i can't comment on ulipristol acetate now because it's been withdrawn from singapore now medical management uh will be sent to the point when the patient is going for high food uh, assuming we have really excluded patients who refuse uh, or or patients who really refused surgery young still not married wants to avoid a scar in the uterus uh, that group of patients then when will i do high food it's actually very practical uh, by the way i'm a, i'm a, in private practice for the past uh, uh, 33 years so my my outlook or viewpoint in managing patients will will deviate from you know all the professors or the academia I tend to take a more practical clinical approach as a private practitioner. So when the patient comes and she wants high food, uh, really, just the other day, patient comes with high food, but the uterus is big, hemoglobin is down. Then I have to think of something to do to use to bring the hemoglobin up. Is either if she's in a hurry, blood transfusion, which I normally don't advise, or the best is give GnRH. for 3 months that serves two purpose one is it shrinks the fibroid so that when i do it is not the 12 cm cm fibroid hopefully it is a 6 cm fibroid and at the same time it brings up the hemoglobin now for patients who are not so big let's say it's 5 to 6 cm and and has to do it fast and, and you will you understand some of us what we do is guided by a lot of factors social economical uh sometimes i think is the insurance company have a lot to say in this and of course 
the bosses, which is going to give them uh, the, the, the leave to, to, to make themselves available for the procedure. So if somebody comes to me 6 a.m., 5 a.m., and wants to do it in a hurry, then I will say, look, the fastest to me still, you, you people don't laugh, is to intramuscular progesterone, not a testosterone, to stop the bleeding first. Until the bleeding is stopped, then I will bring her to uh, for a trial of high food machine. In other words, she'll lie down on the machine and I'll tell her, with this fibroid, I can hit, I can safely achieve a 90% success rate or I just turn away one patient whereby the fibroid is cervical, very posterior cervical, which I know I cannot get the, the ultrasound uh, wave right to where it is supposed to be. I just turned her away and said, okay, lady, I think it's best we go back to laparoscopy or laparotomy to remove the fibroid. Uh, on other occasions whereby the patient said, it's okay, I can wait because my work to do and really on leave uh, in three months time, then I would, I would try my best to give GNRH to bring the fibroid. So very much really depends on the presenting symptoms, the circumstances around the case when I'll do the fibroid. Now, I can't say I will give uh, GNRH to all the fibroids because if I do a trial now, today, and she's due for high food, and I give GNRH three months' time, the size of the fibroid has changed. So the coordinates in which I'm going to fire at the fibroid would have changed. So I normally do the fibroid uh, or the trial nearer to the date whereby I do my high food. Now, when it comes to adenomyosis, again, if I can bring up the hemoglobin, patient is suitable for high food, I will do the high food first. And I always, I always tell them, and look at it, is it a diffuse adenomyosis or is it localized adenomyosis or adenomyoma? The response is different. Adenomyoma responds to high food much better than diffuse adenomyosis. So when it's diffuse adenomyosis, again, I have to counsel the patient that the success rate may be just 50% or 60%. If you're willing to go through it, then I'll go through it. And, and very often, I tell them that you may need a second treatment. It's up to the patient. And, and really, of the 88 patients I've done, uh, I didn't do 1,000 patients. My trainer next to me has done a thousand. I've done 88 personal cases. In one year, I have to repeat a, a high food for adenomyosis. And in one year, a second adenomyosis failed because the pain came back because she's still young and I have to do a surgery. So um, it's very difficult for me to, to have a flow chart uh, in a very simplistic way. But I think this, as you go along, you will probably have your own flow chart according to your own practice, the nature of your practice. I look at the, may I just comment even on classification of fibroids. Everybody will use the classification of fibroids according to the FIGO classification. But when you do high food, you look at a different way of classification because the pedunculated fibroids are probably not amenable to high food because in high food, when the fibroid dies, you need the normal fine tissue and blood vessels to bring the debris away. To, it's like when you have a knot on the forehead, there's a hematoma, it will go away. So imagine the fibroid needs a good um, area or, or, or blood supply to, for it to be resolved into the uterine complex for it to slowly shrink. So when it comes to the pedunculative fibroid, I would say this is not suitable. Now, when it comes to submucous fibroids, I will give the patient a choice whether uh, it is, I have this, my own principle, less than three centimeters submucous type zero, type one, hysteroscopic resection. Type two, and it is big, I would say you can string it first with GNRH, whatever means you have, or I would offer high food. Reason is uh, the classification of looking at high food, I will classify as one, pedunculated, not suitable, 
two suitable all the intramurals, and then subdivide into uh, anterior and posterior, and then the submucus, whereby you either can do five full uh, if it's if it's uh, type type two, and the main bulk of the submucus is still within the uterine cavity, but if it's going to be three centimeters type zero type one, I think that's the easiest to resect. So. Uh, my limited experience tells me that the classification of fibroids in relation to high food management will probably be different from the FIGO management. And that's all my comment. Thank you, Dr. Lee. It was a wonderful explanation about the classification and how to go about to do a uh, high food and the patient selection, which you have uh, properly told and explained to all of us. There are many questions which have been lined. I would like to go back to Dr. Narendra Malhotra. There is a question from Dr. Sarita Anand that she is a 54-year-old uh, woman, two children, and has got multiple uh, fibroids on USG with endometrial thickness of 12 millimeters. She has been treated with ulipristol for four months. And LBC negative, HPE of the endometrium is secretory. She is asymptomatic now for the past four months, sir. Please suggest measures to follow up or follow up. So Dr. Uh, Manjira has already answered that. You just wait, follow up every year. The endometrial thickness is a false here as she explained so beautifully. It's not nothing to worry. The endometrial hyperplasia does not occur with uliprostol. So she's got uh, treated four months. Actually, it should have been three months, one month break, three months and one month break. So either you can follow, continue your therapy for three more cycles. If she's asymptomatic, you just wait, follow up, and uh, by month, uh, yearly ultrasound and pap smear, that's all. Dr. Uh, Anagani, you would like to share your experiences about HIFU and your medical line of treatment? Uh, rather than HIFU, way back in 1998, I think we did our first um, um, uterine artery embolization in a care hospital when we were doing and we were not very happy there are two reasons why i was not happy one is it is we had to depend on a machine here it is mri there we were utilizing a cat lab so we are we are always the second first citizens there so if we are doing mri or anything somebody else wants to use it we are we have to go and get it done in the evening seven o'clock eight o'clock or something like that and then even because the patient is there you're going to be there one being a private doctor we all want money and we are not going to get it the second is the complications when the pa patients start having the extrusion of the fibroid, we did have issues. So that's the one reason which we were not using. And in the middle, in India, when HIFU just entered and when we had Dr. Um, uh, Rakesh Sinha doing it, I had spoken to him about it. So we did have HIFU in uh, Mumbai, in Dr. Rakesh Sinha. He was not very happy about it because HIFU is something which we were not doing it. But in again, 19, 2011 and 12, when Insitec came to India, uh, and we did have in Apollo, Philips and all. We had uh, lots of patients. But again, the same thing in India is all of us are busy. We are not uh, going to only one subject of doing only one thing. And when we have time, the machine is not free. So and then dealing with the complications. Are they? So I think these are the practical points. But now as the younger generation is coming up and they're very clear about they do not want to do the emergencies in the middle of night, less obstetrics, want to stick to fertility or something like that. So, so ultrasound side, if somebody is going and they want to pick this up, this would be a very good modality, especially like Dr. Lee said, for adenomyosis, adenomyoma, where we can only think of mirina and hysterectomy as a better alternative than any other thing. HIFU will wonderfully work for adenomyosis, younger patient, pre-IVF patients, and uh, in DIE. And I'm actually waiting for people to do a lot of studies of HIFU on vulval dystrophies rather than going for all these lasers and all that. Thank you, Dr. Anandani. Now, the next question is to Dr. Narendra. Dr. Rajni Bala is uh, telling about a case. She is a married lady, six years, having a seven centimeters fibroid. This fibroid is intramural and she has never conceived, not ready for a surgery. What to be done with no symptoms? Mm -hmm. So, uh, this patient qualifies for expectant management or medical management. Now, expected management is that uh, if everything else uh, for infertility is working all right, the tubes, ovulation, husband semen parameters, you could give her three, four months or six months of 
time intercourse or with mild stimulation or not, or you give her uliprostol for a uh, course of uliprostol for 12 weeks, 12 uh, courses, uh, four courses, three months each, so one year, and then uh, ask her to conceive if she's not ready for surgery. So by that time, seven centimeters will become almost about three, three and a half, and then conception charges might improve. So uliprostol, uh, four courses, and then conception. So now, very interesting question again to you. Very tricky question. This uh, question is from Dr. Asha Jain, and she has said that myoma during pregnancy, which becomes symptomatic and it is more than four centimeter. How would we manage this case, Dr. Narendra Malotra, sir? Tender loving care. No, <laughs> no unit crystal to be given during pregnancy. Pregnancy is <laughs> contraindicated. Yes. <laughs> It's so, Dr. Asha Jain, we do not give uliprostal in pregnancy, only tender love care. And Dr. Narendra Malhotra. Mild, mild uh, uterine relaxants, mild painkillers, just, just yeah. uh, that's, that's all. I mean, uh, don't give her over, overdose her with progesterone. This might start increasing if you give her more progesterone also. So, don't put her on uh, micronized progesterone or vaginal progesterone. Please don't. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, I, doctor, can I? Madam, yes, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Manila, what would you do? <laughs> now, there are two things here. One, I would agree with you at gender loving care. The second point about progesterone is that sometimes what happens is this itself can irritate the uterus to go for the patient to go into preterm labor. So, that time we should be watching, and if necessary, please do give progesterone, but temporarily, cannot be overdosing it for a long time. That is yeah. so the only for prevention thing. of preterm labor, not for. Yes. Long. Yes. And the second point is there are times when patients, if it is too big a size of a fibroid and it causes their respiratory distress, especially when the twins are there, to continue the pregnancy, there are times when we have done antipartum uh, myomectomy, antenatal myomectomy, whatever. But otherwise, if she ends up with cesarean, cesarean myomectomy would be better in this case. So my, my experience with antipartum myomectomy is over 10 centimeters. Yes. You know that I've, I've managed... Respiratory, uh, respiratory right. distress you know should be that thing. Yes. So if it is very big, yeah, and uh, yes, we have we have done two or three of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Lee, I am coming back to you again. Uh, this is uh, from Dr. Suhasini. Uh, she says that the patient is 54 year old woman. She did a high foo. Can you please elaborate which hormonal profile? you would do after nine months of completion of HIFU on this woman. Thank you, sir. Okay, this case is very interesting because uh, uh, she was uh, a patient that was followed up by another colleague and uh, from a small fibroid became a big fibroid. And, uh, you know, you can reason with a patient what are the, uh, the all the reasons to remove the uterus, bleeding, more than completed family, more than 55 years. I've said before, this 54-year-old woman now behaves like a 34-year-old or dresses like a 34-year-old. So no matter how much you can reason with them, uh, she just want, want it her way. And of course, I, 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 want to do, I want to know for myself uh, whether you should just uh, wait for menopause to come. But she's very adamant of doing something because she said, look, my fiber is growing and my, my other doctor wants to do a hysterectomy. So what I did was I told her, look, I'll, I'll try, but I don't promise. Now, nine months later, and why not six months or nine months is because of the uh, insurance process whereby they only allow uh, uh, MRI to be done after a certain number of months. So nine months later, I saw her and, and uh, at the same time, I, for my own sake, I want to know whether her hormone profile is the same as nine months ago. So that's why I do the hormone profile. So it's not a, it's not a regulation that I'll do a hormone profile. Just like it's not uh, like a regulation that you do liver function tests when you're on uliprostol acetate. So it was my own self-interest that I did it. So after that, the, the fibroid shrinks, but a fibroid will never shrink to zero or disappear. Uh, you either shrink to a size whereby it calcifies, like most of the menopause, or I'll explain to them 
It's like putting sugar cane through the rollers, whether you roll it 10 times or 100 times, the residue, the fibers are still there. So your fibroids was there, but although small, and we probably cannot pick it up from an ultrasound, but if you do an MRI, you can pick it up. So, uh, well, the most end of story is the patient is very uh, happy with the result, and she's just willing to, to wait for her own natural menopause to set it. That, that's the story of that patient. But th there will be a lot of patients like her who get very angry. Doctors also observe and, and the fibers keep going. And this is something I, uh, my younger colleague, I said, if you ask a patient to observe a fibroid, say four centimeters, and, and if the fibroid grows and you still say observe again, be very careful when you say observe. Are you observing that hoping by next year it's getting smaller? or you are observing to wait for it to get worse with the complication. And then, you know, uh, there are a lot of lawyers around waiting behind. So we have to be very careful when we say observe and, and you must have the confidence to say that if you observe that menopause will come, the fibroid will shrink naturally. That's, that is my advice to them now. And I just saw on the screen, somebody asked a question about what, what becomes if you have a high food and you did it for a, a sarcoma. Now, when high food first started, they actually did it for osteosarcoma for two patients, young patients. Uh, one was very successful. A uh, patient got married, have children. The other patient was not so successful because after two years, uh, the other patient died of some other illnesses. Now, in the brain, we used HIFU. In liver, advanced liver cancer and pancreatic cancers, we use HIFU for palliation. So in the event you have done a HIFU on a fibroid that turns out to be sarcoma, I think there's no harm done. The only complaint is, and which has happened, uh, in one of my, my friends from Korea, is the patient came and complained and said that, you know, if you would pick it up earlier, uh, maybe I could have done the surgery earlier. But there's no way to tell because by treating the sarcoma, you may actually have reduced, have done her a favor of reducing the sarcoma size, which make it more amenable for, for surgery. If you take it, if you draw uh, collateral or conclusions from treatment of uh, liver cancers, pancreatic cancers to string so that you get palliative uh, uh, relief, then I think if you've done unknowingly uh, a sarcoma with high food, I don't think you have done uh, a great harm to the patient. Now, we always argue uh, since the, the mosellation uh, on the sarcoma is started on in, in US that there's no good way of telling whether the uterine fibroid is a sarcoma or not. But lo and behold, uh, there are a lot of uh, haifu practitioners in, from China, and one of them is Professor Zhang Lian. Whenever we have a questionable MRI, we'll show it to him. He'll be right 99.9% .9 of the time because they've seen so many MRIs in fact, more than a lot of radiologists on just you trying, you trying uh, tumors. Right. So I, I would say, yes, with experience, we can recognize sarcomatous changes from MRI reports. As I think it's going to come. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, there are many questions. We have already answered them about three to four questions together. So thank you so much. It was regarding uh, uh, finding out whether the patient has got sarcoma before starting the therapy. Now there are, uh, there is one more question uh, from Dr. Rebecca Singson. Um, Uli Pristal has been recalled in some market. She's from Philippines. Are you still recommending Uli Pristal in your country? With, what is your take on this? Dr. Narendra Malhotra. So Uliprestol had an issue with an RCOG warning uh, uh, two years back on that disturbance of the liver function. 
and eight patients in that study uh, landed up with severe uh, liver damage so if the liver function has to be done before starting and then monitoring the other question from some doctor in macau as i could see how we will monitor uh, uliprostal four courses every three months when you uh, every course when you stop three months that non uh, uliprostal month you do a lft so that is how we monitor and if it is getting deranged stop the drug i think you have uh, touched a very relevant point to monitor lft and try to see and that is the best way of monitoring it in india presently it is still continued so we are giving it for the medical line of treatment there are many many questions which have been asked uh, there is one question in nepal sir there is no uliprostal available which drug is best in absence of uliprostal this is dr ram kumar das for dr malotra dr majila will answer this yeah and uh, i my favorite drug if she is married and she is having the uh, children and uh, no problem with intrauterine device lng ius is symptomatically better if she doesn't want oral ones but otherwise my around perimenopausal age group again aromatase inhibitor is something which i would definitely choose over the thing so and otherwise in the younger age group is only symptomatic then ocp so you you have to choose depending on the age of the patient need of the patient and then only decide I think Alembic should make Uliprostal available in Nepal and Nepal. Uh, <laughs> in a period of time. Uh, Doctor Indra Indira Rani, does patient have any febrile symptoms after hypo of large fibroids? Doctor Lee, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Fever, fever. Does she get fever after hypo? Okay, fever after hypo usually is reactionary because you have killed the cell cells. Bleated them, just like in any surgery, uh, whether you remove the fibroid, you remove the hysterectomy, there is always a reactionary uh, fever, uh, which may not be due to infection. Yes, in some of my patients, uh, they do have this febrile response, but they are very mild. They respond very well to paracetamol. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are many questions which are coming, Doctor Ila Gupta. In any asymptomatic fibroid, would we take for hypo? If it is an Mind. asymptomatic fibroid, Doctor Lee, do we take for hypo? And what is the size when treatment is essential? This is not there on the chat. This has been sent to me privately, Doctor Lee. Okay, sure. Um, every good. Clinician will follow guidelines, and one of the guidelines you follow, uh, nice guideline. They say for high food is for symptomatic fibroids. But you know, in the present world, it's not just the the group of us who is discussing. They will go a second opinion, third opinion, and second, third opinion maybe Doctor YouTube, Doctor Google, and they will come back to you, Doctor. <laughs> I put it to you. I put it to you. My fibroid is asymptomatic uh, three years ago, but every screening, every health screening every year, it grows by one centimeter. Now, what going to say? I'm going to say, okay, leave it alone. Then, what if it becomes symptomatic? So, you have to manage expectations now. Like I said, I'm a clinician. I'm on the ground. I cannot give a flow chart or algorithm, but I think. What you would do really depends on on the society we're dealing with, uh, and the society means your your standard of healthcare, the technology which you have, the uh, the skill level in which you are trained, and at the back of the mind, we, we, I always said uh, you know uh, you have to you have to really be very careful of what we say to patients now because there's always a, a lawyer lurking around. Uh, the medical centers and the hospitals. I would like to just add one sentence to what Dr. Lee has told. Uh, first, yes, we have to follow the guidelines. So, nice guidelines says symptomatic, but ACOG guidelines also says if it is going to affect the patient in any way, in the sense psychologically also. So, if the patient is getting mentally stressed over the fibroid, I think that should be taken as a symptom and should be taken care of. Good, very good. <laughs> So you read the guidelines? Yes, <laughs> we do read it. Okay, uh, I will go for the last question now. 
this is to dr narendra malhotra if the patient has multiple fibroids and she is unmarried then with hifu should we go with hifu or should we go with any drug or there has to be any gap with medical line of treatment medical. or hifu so if it is multiple fibroids the hifu will have to be uh, put into multiple places so it, it it will not be a simple procedure so the, it it has to be a medical management and uh, if she remains asymptomatic with medical management and improves continue with that till she gets married till she fertility issues arise then we will think about either a laparoscopy or continue the medical treatment absolutely thank you thank you i would like to now end uh, this session now there are many many questions which have been lined up there is one question from dr mohammad uh, this is the last question i am going to take now dr lee i want you to be very brief uh, in view of the covid 19 pandemic what is the unique advantage of hifu oh okay <laughs> uh, okay number one You can observe all the guidelines, distancing guidelines, hospital uh, guidelines, masks. You know, wash hands and everything. Uh, the advantage of uh, the hifu is you do not need to have it in the core, the most important part of the hospital, which is uh, your operating theaters. So you have it in one of the side rooms or departments, whereby patients can walk in and walk out, and everybody mask as per normal and Safe distancing because uh, the patient is at least a meter away from you, and all the nurses, uh, after monitoring the patient, they can look at the monitors. The anesthetist is there to make the patient quite comfortable. So I would say, in view of COVID nineteen, and especially for symptomatic patients, instead of operating, because uh, the high floor room is really uh, away from the hustle and bustle of the hospital. Whereas in the operating theater, patient has to go through all the all all the uh, reception area, theater room one, room two, and then room two, the operating theater, and after that you have to go in the recovery. There's a lot of personal movements around, so I think Haifu is safer when it compared to uh, present day uh, surgeries. Thank you, Doctor Lee. It was a wonderful to have all of you here with us, and. quality content and science has no boundaries we have witnessed first time in the history tog webinar where more than 6500 users have joined from all over the globe here esteemed speakers from singapore india and we will continue with this trust with knowledge because knowledge is infinite knowledge is power and knowledge has to be given to everyone so thank you all of you and i would like now shreemont to put our slide to show we will be having the next global perspective on covid which is on 25th of april we have got speakers from israel from germany from italy milan and we have our indian panelist where we will be having obstetrics and gynecology practices during covid 19 so i welcome all of you to join indian standard time 4 to 5 pm 25th april 2020 thank you all of you to join us